Chapter 2 Under the Sea Dome Had the surface of Venus been what it seemed to be at first glance, the Venus marble would have smashed to scrap and burned to ash. The career of Lucky Star would have ended at that moment. Fortunately, the vegetation that had so thickly met the eye was neither grass nor shrubbery, but seaweed. The flat plain was no surface of soil and rock, but water, the top of an ocean that surrounded and covered all of Venus. The Venus marble, even so, hit the ocean with a thunderous rattle, tore through the ropey weeds, and boiled its way down to the depths. Lucky and Vigman were hurled against the walls. An ordinary vessel might have been smashed, but the Venus marble had been designed for entering water at high speed. Its seams were tight, its form streamlined, its wings, which Lucky had neither time nor knowledge to retract, were torn loose and its frame groaned under the shock, but it remained seaworthy. Down, down it went into the green, black murk of the Venusian Ocean. The cloud-diffused light from above was almost totally stopped by the tight weed cover. The ship's artificial lighting did not go on, its workings apparently put out of order by the shock of contact. Lucky's senses were whirling. Bigman, he called. There was no answer, and he stretched out his arms, feeling. His hand touched Bigman's face. Bigman, he called again. He felt the little Martian's chest, and the heart was beating regularly. Relief washed over Lucky. He had no way of telling what was happening to the ship. He knew he could never find any way of controlling it in the complete darkness that enveloped them. He could only hope that the friction of the water would halt the ship before it struck bottom. He felt for the pencil flash in his shirt pocket, a little plastic rod some six inches long that, on activation by thumb pressure, became a solid glow of light that streamed out forward, its beam broadening without seeming to weaken appreciably. Lucky groped for Bigman again and examined him gently. There was a lump on the Martian's temple, but no broken bones so far as Lucky could tell. Bigman's eyes fluttered. He groaned. Lucky whispered, Take it easy, Bigman. We'll be all right. He was far from sure of that as he stepped out into the corridor. The pilots would have to be alive and cooperative if the ship were ever to see home port again. They were sitting up, blinking at Lucky's flash as he came to the door. What happened? groaned Johnson. One minute I was at the controls and then... There was no hostility, only pain and confusion in his eyes. The Venus Marvel was back to partial normality. It was limping badly, but its searchlights, fore and aft, had been restored to operation, and the emergency batteries had been rigged up to supply them with all the power they would need for vital operations. The churning of the propeller could be dimly heard, and the planetary coaster was displaying, adequately enough, its third function. It was a vessel that could navigate not only in space and in air, but underwater as well. George Revelle stepped into the control room. He was downcast and obviously embarrassed. He had a gash on his cheek, which Lucky had washed, disinfected, and neatly sprayed with coagulum. Revelle said, There are a few minor seepages, but I plugged them. The wings are gone, and the main batteries are all junked up. We'll need all sorts of repairs, but I guess we're lucky at that. You did a good job, Mr. Williams. Lucky nodded briefly. Suppose you tell me what happened. Revolve flushed. I, I don't know. I hate to say it, but I don't know. How about you? Asked Lucky, addressing the other. Tor Johnson, his large hands, nursing the radio back to life, shook his head. Revolve said, The last clear thoughts I can remember were while we were still inside the cloud layer. Remember nothing after that till I found myself staring at your flash. Lucky said, Do you or Johnson use drugs of any kind? Johnson looked up angrily. He rumbled, No, nothing. What made you black out? And both at the same time, too. Reval said, I wish I knew. Look, Mr. Williams, neither one of us is an amateur. Our records are coaster pilots of first class. He groaned, or at least we were first class pilots. We'll probably be grounded after this. We'll see, said Lucky. Say, look, said Big Man testily, what's the use of talking about what's over and gone? Where are we going now? That's what I want to know. Where are we going? Tor Johnson said, We're way off course. I can tell you that much, but it'll be five or six hours before we get out to Aphrodite. Fat Jupiter and little satellites, said Bigman, staring at the blackness outside the port in disgust. 
five or six hours in this black mass? Aphrodite is the largest city on Venus, with a population of over a quarter of a million. With the Venus marvel still a mile away, the sea about it was lit into green translucence by Aphrodite's lights. In the eerie luminosity, the dark, sleek shapes of the rescue vessels, which had been sent out to meet them after radio contact had been established, could be plainly made out. They slipped along, silent companions. As for Lucky and Bigman, it was their first sight of Venus's underwater domed cities. They almost forgot the unpleasantness unpleasantness they had just passed through in the amazement at the wonderful object before them. From a distance it seemed an emerald green fairyland bubble, shimmering and quivering because of the water between them. Dimly they could make out buildings and the structural webbing of the beams that held up the city dome against the weight of water overhead. It grew larger and glowed more brightly as they approached. The green grew lighter as the distance of water between them grew less. Aphrodite became less unreal, less fairylandish, but even more magnificent. Finally, they slid into a huge airlock capable of holding a small fleet of freighters or a large battle cruiser, and waited while the water was pumped out. And when that was done, the Venus Marvel was floated out of the lock and into the city on a lit field. Lucky and Bigman watched as their luggage was removed, shook hands gravely with Raval and Johnson, and took a scrimmer to the Hotel Bellevue Aphrodite. Bigman looked out of the curved window as their skimmer, its gyro wings revolving with stately dignity, moving lightly among the city's beams and over its rooftops. He said, So this is Venus. I don't know if it's worth going through so much for it, though. Never forget that ocean coming up at us. Lucky said, I'm afraid that was just the beginning. Bigman looked uneasily at his big friend. You really think so? Lucky shrugged. It depends. Let's see what Evans has to tell us. The green room of the Hotel Bellevue Aphrodite was just that. The quality of the lighting and the shimmering of the, it gave the tables and guests the appearance of being suspended beneath the sea. The ceiling was an inverted bowl, below which there turned slowly a large aquarium globe, supported by cunningly placed lift beams. The water in it was laced with strands of Venusian seaweed, and in it among it writhed colorful sea ribbons, one of the most beautiful forms of animal life on the planet. Bigman had come in first, intent on dinner. He was annoyed at the absence of a punch menu, disturbed by the presence of actual human waiters, and resentful over the fact that he was told that diners in the green room ate a meal supplied by the management and only that. He was mollified, slightly, when the appetizer turned out to be tasty and the soup very good. Then the music started, the domed ceiling gradually came to glowing life, and the aquarium globe began its gentle spinning. Bigman's mouth fell open. His dinner was forgotten. Look at that, he said. Lucky was looking. The sea ribbons were of different lengths, varying from tiny threads two inches long to broad, sinuous belts that stretched a yard or more from end to end. They were all thin, thin as a sheet of paper. They moved by wriggling their bodies into a series of waves that rippled down their body lengths. And each one fluoresced. Each one sparkled with colored light. It was a tremendous display. Down the sides of each sea ribbon were glowing little spirals of light. Crimson, pink, and orange, a few blues and violets scattered through, and one or two striking among the larger specimens. All were overcast with the light green wash of the external light. As they swam, the lines of color snapped and interlaced. To the dazzled eye, they seemed to be leaving a rainbow trail that washed and sparkled in the water, fading out only to be renewed in still brighter tints. Bigman turned his attention reluctantly to his dessert. The waiter called it jelly seeds, and at first the little fellow had regarded the dish suspiciously. The jelly seeds were soft orange ovals, which clung together just a bit, but came up readily enough in the spoon. For a moment they felt dry and tasteless to the tongue, but then suddenly they melted into a thick, syrupy liquid that was sheer delight. Space, said the astonished Bigman. Have you ever tried the dessert? 
What? asked Lucky absently. Taste the dessert, will you? It's like thick pineapple juice, only a million times better. What's the matter? Lucky said, we have company. Oh, go on. Bigman made a move to turn in the seat as though to inspect the other diners. Lucky said quietly, take it easy, and that froze Bigman. Bigman heard the soft steps of someone approaching their table. He tried to twist his eyes. His own blaster was in his room, but he had a force knife in his belt pocket. It looked like a watch fob, but it could slice a man in two if necessary. He fingered it intensely. A voice behind Bigman said, May I join you folks? Bigman turned in his seat, force knife palmed and ready for a quick upward thrust. But the man looked anything but sinister. He was fat, his clothes fit well, his face was round, and his graying hair was carefully combed over the top of his head, though his baldness showed anyway. His eyes were a little blue and full of what seemed like friendliness. Of course, he had a large grizzled mustache of a true Venusian fashion. Lucky said calmly, sit down by all means. His attention seemed entirely centered on a cup of hot coffee that he cradled in his right hand. This fat man sat down. His hands rested upon the table. One wrist was exposed, slightly shaded by the palm of the other. For an instant, an oval spot on it darkened and turned black. Within it, little yellow grains of light danced and flickered in the familiar patterns of the Big Dipper and of Orion. Then it disappeared, and there was only an innocent plump wrist and the smiling round face of a fat man above it. That identifying mark of the Council of Science could be neither forged nor imitated. The method of its controlled appearance by the exertion of will was just about the closely, most closely guarded secret of the Council. The fat man said, my name is Mel Morris. Lucky said, I rather thought you were. You've been described to me. Bigman sat back and returned his force knife to its place. Mel Morris was head of the Venusian section of the council. Bigman had heard of him. In a way, he was relieved, and in another way, he was a little disappointed. He had expected a fight, perhaps a quick dash of coffee in the fat man's face, the table overturned, and from then on, anything... Lucky said, Venus seems to be an unusual and beautiful place. You have observed our fluorescent aquarium? It is very spectacular, said Lucky. The Venusian councilman smiled and raised a finger. The waiter brought him a hot cup of coffee. Morris let it cool for a moment, then said softly, I believe you are disappointed to see me here. You expected other company, I believe. Lucky said coolly, I looked forward to an informal conversation with a friend. In fact, said Morse, you had sent a message to Councilman Evans to meet you here. I see you know that. Quite. Evans has been under close observation for quite a while. Communications to him are intercepted. Their voices were low. Even Bigman had trouble hearing them as they faced one another, sipping coffee and allowing no trace of expression in their words. Lucky said, you're wrong to do this. You speak as his friend? I do. And I suppose that, as your friend, he warned you to stay away from Venus? You know about that, too, I see. Quite. And you had a near-fatal accident landing on Venus, am I right? You are. You're implying that Evans feared some such event? Feared it? Great space star. Your friend Evans engineered that accident. And thus concludes the second chapter. I hope you're all enjoying and are having the Happy New Year thus far since we're about halfway through the month of January. Anyway, everyone have a good day and I'll see you all next Monday. Bye!